Happy Monday here at the Scarlet Faithful. I'm Aaron Brightman. Going to talk about Rutgers football now, heading into the bye week 2-0, following a 49-17 win over Akron. Saturday, SHI Stadium, I had a rapid reaction, as well as Sunday night came out with my Big Ten Week 2 review, Week 3 preview, and covered a little bit there in terms of where I thought Rutgers was at, but wanted to expand my thoughts in this episode. And overall, I think the bottom line is they've taken care of business. It's not a perfect team. They've shown some concerns in certain areas. I think they've shown some progress in certain areas. And at the end of the day, when they were challenged, although against two not great teams and not challenged severely, Rutgers responded. And I think that's what you want to see. And I think you saw them wear both of those teams down. Now, whether that can be a trend, of course, we did see Rutgers wear some teams down in the Big Ten last season, as well as Miami, Virginia Tech. So I think there's no reason to think that just because it came against Howard and Akron, that that isn't necessarily not going to be the identity of Rutgers once again. And most notably, Kyle Manungai is the guy that, looks even better this year and is the ringleader of wearing teams down. And the fact that he had such uh, explosiveness on Saturday, Steve Politi throwing Rutgers fans a olive branch by officially, unofficially launching the Heisman campaign for Manungai. Again, I would just go back to, and I mentioned this in my Big Ten review, it's too early to really know. We, we won't know... We will know so much more about this Rutgers team following their trip to Blacksburg against Virginia Tech in two weeks than we know yet. And there's a lot of hopes. There's certainly reasons for optimism. I thought the offensive line, the stability there, the uh, amount of snaps that this team has gotten at the offensive line uh, in terms of their consistency, once again on uh, Saturday, uh, the starters really getting the bulk of the snaps, having uh, Tyler Needham, a right tackle. I mean, he's graded out as the best tackle in college football so far, which is phenomenal. He had a uh, really high grade, 91.7 on Saturday. Aside from Needham, every other starter played 62 snaps alongside him. Tyler Needham on the right tackle, Kobe Asamoah, right guard, Gus Alinkis, center, Brian Felter, left guard. Holland Pierce left tackle. That is something in terms of all of the starters, except actually for Needham, who missed, uh, who only played 50 snaps out of the 63 the starters did in week one. That is a lot of stability, and you're seeing progress. And they haven't been perfect, right? I mean, there was a couple of short runs that got stopped on in week one. There was a little bit of, you know, one thing I failed to mention about the reaction, Kalik Menace's interception. He, got, he had a lot of pressure on him. He got hit. So there were some breakdowns, you know, in terms of the run game a little bit in that first half. But overall, I think the offensive line, how you see them performing together as a unit, their cohesiveness, their ability to wear inferior opponents down, right? I mean, I know that's that's what they're supposed to do, but they're doing it. So that's a positive. Now, can they go into Blacksburg and do that against the Hokies? That's a whole different story. But I think... We saw how they performed last year against Big Ten competition, Virginia Tech, Miami. And I think this group is better. It's year two of Coach Flats. And you're seeing his imprints on this unit. And it's really exciting to see Manungai the way he's running and to see the offensive line and what they've been able to build on since last year. You've had some flashes at wide receiver. I still think it's still an unproven group. I mean, Dimir Miller has been the most consistent. He's the one that we were expecting to be the top receiver. He's essentially filled that slot role. Christian Dremel uh, has been pretty much obsolete in the past game, the first two weeks. Nine receivers have a catch. He's not one of them. So that's interesting, right? He has been the punt returner. He's been out there a little bit. But yeah, Chris Long step up. Obviously, that deep ball. I wanted to talk about Ethan Calix Manis and Chris Long on that deep ball. And the importance of putting that on film now for Virginia Tech 
having to prepare for Rutgers to be able to throw the ball downfield. That's not something they had to prepare for last year. And another thought or comment, by the way, someone gave me a little bit of flack after the rapid reaction that I, you know, slammed Gavin Wimsett for saying that, you know, he couldn't throw the deep ball and uh, it's easy to kick him while he's down. I was, and I took a lot of heat last year for defending and believing in Gavin Wimsett the entire season because I thought he had potential to really become a good quarterback. And unfortunately, he wasn't able to put it together at Rutgers, right? And we don't need to lament what happened in Kentucky on Saturday. He, he had an interception. He had some good runs coming in from the backup role. But the bottom line is Rutgers did not have the intermediate, the short, intermediate, or long passing in terms of accuracy, in terms of ability last season with Wimsy the quarterback that they now have with Cali Manis. And that's that's just fact. And if I don't say that, then that that's bad on me, right? That's not knocking Wimsy. That's pointing out an obvious, in my opinion, obvious improvement for this offense. So that's where I'm coming from there. And I just think Rutgers opening things up a little bit. You know, I thought it was going to be three scoops of vanilla. I think it was uh, maybe two scoops of vanilla, maybe some cherry vanilla thrown in. There was some, you know, passing thrown in in that second half. And as Shiano noted in week one, they had a few deep play calls scheduled that didn't work out just based on coverages. Uh, But three of seven on 15-plus yard passes on Saturday. Still need improvement on that, right? But I think in two weeks now, Cali Manis was 15 of 20 in short to meet intermediate passes in week one. And he was 11 of 16 in week two. So you're talking about 26 of 36 through two weeks. And that is right at 70%. That's pretty good. It's not elite, but that is a major improvement from last season. And if you could just be close to 50% on deep balls, it's going to go a long way. And again, Cali Manis struggled at times against Akron. I was surprised. I don't know if he was tight. I don't know if he was forcing things. Uh, but, you know, he didn't go through his progressions very well in that first half. He was he was definitely uh, – I mean, this, is this isn't the most eloquent way to say it, but he was like jumping the gun. Like he was just looking to get the ball out of the pocket, out of his hands, and into a receiver. And he started 5 of 12. He got picked off once. He almost got picked off, I believe, a second time or at least – there, there was some questionable throws at times. He was thrown into coverage. And I don't know if he wasn't, it was just a lack of patience, whatever. But he certainly gained confidence and gained command in that second half. And that's encouraging. So I think the biggest thing with this Rutgers team as a whole is expectations are so high from many fans. I think maybe the expectation for where they would be through two weeks in terms of how they, you know, it's, I've, I said this a lot last year, you know, talking about pr- predicting them to be six and six last year. But when you predict them to go six and six, you don't, it's hard for all the fans to understand what that six and six looks like. That, that isn't a, uh, it's an up and down path, right? You're going to have moments where you think this team doesn't look very good. And even though this team has a higher ceiling, I believe, and pretty much everybody believes, then six and six. And it would be a disappointment if they didn't go better than six and six this year. That doesn't mean they're not going to have moments where they, they, they still have some concern or they don't look great, right? And I know some have said they're concerned about the slow starts against Howard, against Akron. I mean, I think that's been pretty much the case for a lot of teams in college football the first two weeks. And that's part of what I'm saying in terms of we, we really don't know yet. You know, you can't afford a slow start in Blacksburg, no doubt, right? You can't fall behind Virginia Tech 14 nothing and feel good about it. But at the same time, there's been a lot of bigger programs that have struggled against so far competition and haven't blown the doors off by any match, imagine. And Rutgers showed the ability to run away with both these games. Again, two inferior opponents. And now you have 10 games left. Virginia Tech, nine Big Ten games. 
where I can see Rutgers losing to any of those 10 teams. But I honestly can see them beating any of those 10 teams as well. And that includes that USC. Not an easy game. Not going to be uh, expected to win that game. Talent-wise, USC is far superior to Rutgers. But I think Rutgers, I think what Rutgers has going for it is Rutgers' identity, which is they, if they're going to beat teams in the Big Ten and Virginia Tech, it's going to be because they're going to be a more physical team. It's because they're going to limit their mistakes. And it's because they have Kyle Manungai running it down their throats in the fourth quarter. And part of that, that could be more effective now, is because you have Ethan Kalik Manis capable of completing passes downfield. And now you have Virginia Tech. They have a night game at Old Dominion next week. And then they're going to have to come back. And they're going to have to prepare for a Rutgers offense in a different way than they did last year. Now, I think Virginia Tech has just had this game circled for a long time. Brent Fry, disappointing loss at Vandy. Hokie fans are you know, disappointed with how they've suffered some bad losses in September. This game, they're going to be amped up for Rutgers. They're, Rutgers is going to get Virginia Tech's best. And can this Rutgers team handle it? And I go back to, I think they could be the more physical team than Virginia Tech. I think that they're going to have to limit mistakes. And that's a big part of Cali McManus there in Virginia Tech. Um, you know, he's gone on the road in the Big Ten and won when he was at Minnesota. So he's been in some hostile environments before. But that's really going to be the evolution of this team. If they can go into Virginia Tech, if Cali McManus can complete some deep balls in that game, if he could be accurate in the short to intermediate routes, limit mistakes, Manungai can be Manungai. And in terms of the Heisman idea, if, listen, if he goes into Virginia Tech and, and rushes for 150, 160, 170 yards, and they win that game, put it all behind him, right? Just get that campaign going. Not saying you can't do it now, but I just think it's it's still too early. You know, and, and all the analytics stuff, with proof, uh, I mean, I look, listen. I'm looking at the grades right now in terms of Pro Football Focus. Rutgers is one of the best, highly best graded teams in college football, but they haven't played anyone yet, so they should be where they're at. Right? Let's see how they are against tougher competition. Got to stay level, in my opinion, in terms of where we're at. I think a lot of encouraging signs, but there's certainly a road ahead where they have to still prove it. Right. And I think that just kind of going back to what I said about wide receiver depth, it's still a little bit unproven. You know, you've had guys show signs. Ian Strong had a catch, not much more than that. KJ Duff showed some signs on Saturday. Chris Long broke out. You know, can they have consistency with their playmakers in the pass game? Kenny Fletcher scored a touchdown for the second straight week, it was an athletic touchdown. Um, so that's going to be key. But we go back to the availability report. Rutgers had 22 on it in game one, 17 in game two. You missed some key guys again in week two. Wesley Bailey, yet to play. Tyreen Powell, yet to play. Flip Dixon, yet to play. We know Mo Ture, obviously out for the season. Troy Rainey, a key guy in the defensive line, has been out, has not played yet. And then you have Sam Brown now, who didn't play in game two after a strong game one. I didn't talk much about Antoine Raymond in the post game, but he looked good. In his most action, his second game ever in his college career, a reclass who signed late, kind of amazing that nine months later, you know, he's he's making an impact for Rutgers. So his role is going to be huge if Sam Brown isn't available in Virginia Tech. Uh, although you'll get, you know, a healthy, healthy, healthy dose of Kyle Monungai, who should be bubble wrapped, by the way, for these next two weeks, please. Um, but in terms of Rutgers, on the defensive side, the run defense has been okay. And statistically, you know, the run defense uh, hasn't graded out great. You know, it was, it was fine in week one, 74. It was just a 65.1% against pro football focus, which just, you know, is a kind of mid. Um, and they, they've given up some big plays, you know. And, and I think this isn't to be a criticism of the linebackers, but you lose so much without Deion Jennings from last year. Mo, Mo Ture out for the year. Tyreen Powell hasn't played. Um, the guys that they have, you know, the, the rotation, they're, they're, I think they're fine, you know. But they're going to have to 
make strides here. And that's why the bye week is so key in terms of applying lessons learned through the first two weeks. And you're going into a hostile environment in two weeks now. And situational awareness, the ability to read the offense, to make split decisions, not just to make plays, but to be able to identify what's going on and to make correct decisions and then be able to physically pull it off. That's that's a nuance there. That's not, it's, I, I think it's taken for granted. So that's my concern with the Rutgers defense. When you're going to Virginia Tech, you're playing Chiron Drones, who's emerged as a very good quarterback. He gave Rutgers some trouble in his uh, first extended action for the Hokies last year. And he's very good. And we, we know over the years have been tortured by running quarterbacks. Uh, he left that game against Vandy at the end. It was apparently cramping. He played against Marshall on Saturday. They won 31-14. He looked really good. He's going to be a real challenge. And the run defense of Rutgers, obviously pass defense too, right? Tyron Jones can throw the rock. But you have a lot more confidence, I think, in the secondary it's a veteran group, and you've seen Eric Rogers step up so far. Kosh Sanders is sh- splashed at times. And hopefully Flip Dixon's back. Tyree Powell, we'll see. But Wesley Bailey, that defensive line, they got more pressure on Saturday. The pass rush grade was much higher in week two, 86.5, which is very good. Coverage, by the way, both games have been over an 80. That's really solid. Um And the defense overall has gotten over an 80 grade in both games too. So offense as well. Rutgers is grading really high. But as I said, the competition is going to ramp up now. And these next 10 games, I mean, you could see them. They're not going to go 10 and 0. They're not going to go 0 and 10. But they they could win or lose any of these remaining games now. And it starts at Virginia Tech. And this bye week, I think, is in really good position for the way the state of this team. Obviously, it's a veteran team, but you have a lot of guys that you're having to develop now because of key spots being injured. So we're not going to know going into Virginia Tech who's going to be available, who's not. And I think the defense is really, I think they certainly have the talent without the key guys that they have to be good. But that's a key spot to go into in a hostile environment to be able to step up and really ramp it up. So I think this extra week of prep time is huge and a very good thing for this program. Overall, I think there's a lot more to come in terms of where this team can go. But if you're talking about a special season, if you're talking about, I think special, listen, eight and four would be very good and I'd be thrilled. But I think special season starts at nine wins. If you want to have a special season, if you believe this could be a special season, nothing has happened so far to make you believe that can't happen. You could be critical that they haven't been perfect. And there are there red flags showing, you know, is there, are they not going to be able to generate enough pressure on the defensive line? Is a run defense not going to be a stout? Are they going to have trouble wearing teams down offensively? when the competition rises. Those are concerns. I don't think any of them are red flags. And I think the biggest concern, of course, is injuries and availability. And, you know, Shiano kind of didn't really hint. He said in the post game, we might have one or two more injuries now. He didn't say it exactly that way, but that's what he inferred. So always a concern. And for a team that you want to see take a huge step forward this year, that is going to be on the front of our minds all season and was always kind of a major concern in terms of what could derail this season. The number one reason this season could get derailed is injuries. And you have a lot of key guys playing, playing well, but you're still missing some key guys. So we'll see what happens through this bye week. But I think developmental wise, the guys that have stepped up, you have a lot of young players on defense. You have an opportunity for the offensive line to get some reps and really continue that step forward for that group. Wide receivers still hashing it out. Running back situation behind the guy, we don't know. And Cali Command is just going to get more and more reps and continue to build some confidence. But he's got to start the game, obviously, in Blacksburg with a lot more confidence in the beginning. 
a lot more poise. But at the end of the day, he's still shown a lot, I think. And he's not he's not a top five quarterback in the Big Ten. But is he a top half? Is he a middle of the pack quarterback? I think he is. I think he's shown that he can be. And if he is, again, going back to last year, major progress. And all that, that what that's going to mean in Big Ten play when the grind starts with Manungai, with this offensive line. If you have a quarterback that complete passes down the field, Rutgers is going to be harder to beat down the stretch. The defense just has to be good. They don't have to be elite for Rutgers to win more games this year. I believe that. So that's why my confidence remains high. This can be a better season. Overall, 2-0. and A lot to look forward to still. Things are really going to ramp up here at the end of September. And I'll have plenty of coverage this week. Uh, I'll have another football podcast at least at one point of David Anderson on. And uh, who, uh, who knows what else will come up or what I think of. Uh, I'll have a Hoops Recruiting podcast out. They have a lot of key visitors in the next month, just counting last week, and then the couple games coming ahead. And then also, uh, if you don't subscribe or check out my YouTube channel, if you're listening to this on uh, Apple or Spotify, thank you. But I'm also putting out a lot of content on my YouTube channel uh, in terms of, you know, I put out Shiano's press conferences every one. I had a highlight reel of every, uh, every score uh, for Rutgers in the wins over Howard and Akron. I have highlight videos there. I have a, a video that just came out in terms of that big uh, pass, Cali Manis to Long, and all the reasons that benefited Rutgers, multiple reasons. I get into that a little bit. And then also I'm going to have, uh, I'll have something coming out by Kyle Manungai. I I'm going to profile all his big runs so far this season. So I'll, I'll have video content coming out throughout the year. Also with hoops too. Might have some hoops uh, scheduling news next week. Plus we'll see. Uh, but I'll have plenty on that when that happens, getting close to practice, starting for Rutgers men's basketball, Olympic sports are in full swing. Women's soccer has now won three games in a row, non-conference play, entering Big Ten play. They had a big 2-0 win over NC State on Sunday. Ali Post, both goals. Uh, Riley Tiernan had two assists. Field hockey lost a tough one against UConn. They host St. Joe soon. Uh, volleyball had a straight set win over Louisiana Tech. Uh, Men's soccer has won their last couple. They beat Princeton a little while ago. So I'm going to keep covering, you know, Olympic sports, give you updates throughout this as well. A lot going on, full swing, AD search. I'll have a podcast on that soon in terms of candidates that I think Rutgers should pursue. Now there's news that Jonathan Holloway might be leaving Rutgers. There is a lot going on and still a lot of reasons for optimism throughout this period for Rutgers University, Rutgers Athletics, and we'll cover it all here at the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. Thanks so much for listening and watching once again. 